e peço também que, se possível, retirem as baterias. Celulares e peço também que, se possível, retirem as baterias, o chip e coloquem... ímpeto oficial de coletar tudo, que é como foi chamada internamente a, a política de armazenamento insano de dados, de cruzamento de dados, de pessoas comum, comuns como nós, é, e se infiltrando em empresas de internet, no Google, na Apple, Facebook, todo mundo aqui, eu não preciso explicar que todo mundo aqui tem aí contas em diversas dessas... É, Dessas, dessas empresas de tecnologia. E o Charles Ferguson, que está do meu lado, é, eu tenho a honra de apresentar o primeiro prêmio Oscar aqui em Paraty. Ele é um, fez um trabalho notável, chamado Inside Job, em português é trabalho interno, em que ele esmiuça, explica, é, disseca o que foi essa crise financeira que até hoje tem consequências. É, a gente está vivendo o mesmo sistema financeiro que, que, que fez os americanos perderem as suas casas, né? que fez as pessoas é, perderem a sua poupança e, e pessoas comuns como, como nós. Né? Então essa mesa traz aqui uma conversa sobre espionagem, sobre imperialismo, sobre mercado financeiro, mas também sobre a nossa vida dia, diária, sobre o cotidiano, sobre as ameaças que existem às nossas liberdades a nossa privacidade, ao nosso patrimônio é, que está sob custódia de instituições financeiras. Então eu vou começar pedindo para os autores fazerem uma, uma breve é, explanação dos, do, dos projetos que, que o trazem aqui a Paraty e também falar dos dobramentos recentes. Eu vou pedir até para o Glenn Greenwald começar porque ontem mesmo tivemos um, mais um desdobramento das dessa cobertura que rendeu a ele e aos jornais onde ele publicou é, a cobertura, o prêmio Pulitzer, o mais importante do jornalismo, é, que foi dado à reportagem que ele publicou no jornal The Guardian. Ele também no Brasil ganhou o S, junto com o jornal o Globo, e ganhou o Polk nos Estados Unidos, a ocasião que ele voltou pela primeira vez aos Estados Unidos depois de ter feito essas denúncias. Mas ontem o Obama fez uma... É, uma confissão, não é? Ele, ele, o que foi que o Obama disse? E eu queria que você explicasse, então, para a gente o que é essa sua, essa grande reportagem que você. Hi, first of all, hello everybody. Um, yeah, yesterday uh, Obama was asked about a scandal in the United States. There is an investigation that the American Senate is conducting into the CIA's use of torture over the last 10 years. And they've been investigating torture, American torture around the world for two or three years now. And the CIA is very worried about what this investigation will reveal because the CIA essentially committed very serious war crimes of the kind that the United States has demanded other countries and other agencies be punished for for many years. And in order to find out what the Senate was doing, the CIA actually spied on the Senate's investigation. They invaded the computers that they were using. They read the emails back and forth between the Senate investigators. And when the accusation that the CIA did this was first revealed, the head of the CIA, who is President Obama, is one of his closest advisors. He used to work in the White House, and, and he's now the head of the CIA, John Brennan. He publicly denied that the CIA did this. And in fact, they even filed a criminal investigation against people in the Senate, um, claiming that they had uh, maligned them and had made false claims. And this week, it turned out there was a, an investigation done within the CIA into these allegations. And the CIA investigators themselves concluded that, in fact, the CIA had invaded the computer networks of the Senate and had spied on the investigation. And so it turned out the CIA director lied. Um, the CIA really did spy on the Senate, um, which is an extraordinary threat to just 
democracy. And so Obama had to address this, and um, he addressed it by saying that he still has the full confidence of the director of the CIA because apparently President Obama is not bothered by spying on the Senate and then lying <coughs> to the public about it. Um, but he had to also address the investigation itself. And one of the things he said was he admitted, I think for the first time when he was president, he said, the, he said, we tortured some folks. That was his exact quote. Um, so it was significant because it was an admission by the American president that the United States actually did torture people. But it was also significant because of the way he phrased it. We tortured some folks. It's it's very casual um, way of, of admitting to the most serious war crime a country can do. And he then went on to say, oh, but you have to understand the people who did the torturing were under a lot of pressure. They had a lot of fear about terrorism. And so we really shouldn't judge them um, sanctimoniously as though, yeah, they tortured, but you know, they were good people, just good people who tortured. Um, and you know, this really underscores, I think, President Obama's last six years in office, which is he says nice, pretty words to people. Um, but at the same time, the policies that underlie American imperialism and the mindset that underlies it, which is we as Americans are the most powerful and therefore we can do whatever we want in the world. We can invade other countries and destroy them. We can decide people should die and send drones over to them. We can spy on the entire world um, and we can even torture them without any consequences is something that he very much believes in. And I think those comments yesterday indicated that. É, Charles, você é, fez também um trabalho de muita envergadura que expôs é, o mecanismo de, muito difícil de compreender para um leigo de como é, a crise bancária, quer dizer, como os bancos estimularam pessoas a comprar papéis é, podres, né, que não valiam nada. É, e eles fizeram isso com o, o suporte de, de professores universitários das melhores universidades, onde todos aqui gostariam de ver seus filhos, né? é, que fizeram estudos é, errados sobre a Islândia, por exemplo, falando o título do artigo de, do seu entrevistado, até dizia, ah, uma, novas oportunidades no horizonte, e ele depois corrigiu, diz, é, a, simplesmente trocou o adjetivo é, como que invertendo completamente o, o significado do artigo. Né? Então, foi um conluio entre é, bancos, entre autoridades financeiras e entre é, é, professores universitários que, que, que alimentam os relatórios dos bancos e estimulam, no final das contas, as pessoas a investir, que levou a essa crise gravíssima de consequências globais. É, como foi... Eu, que você começou essa, esse trabalho, foi no calor da hora, a, a bomba estourou e você sentiu que precisava estar lá? E, e quais foram as consequências? Porque também me parece que, como o Glenn Greenwald estava contando, de certa forma tudo continua igual, né? não, não, não se puniram os responsáveis e a legislação não, não foi substancialmente alterada. Como, como foram as consequências disso? Um, uh, this has been an extraordinary journey for me, um, working on uh, these issues. I actually uh, started life, you know, I, I don't know whether you'll regard this as uh, something of which I should be deeply ashamed or... <laughs> I, I actually started my adult life as a member of the establishment. Uh, I got a PhD in political science from MIT. My thesis advisor uh, was a very eminent American who had been a professor at Harvard, had been deputy national security advisor for President Kennedy. Um, I, I dealt very fluidly, very comfortably with uh, people in the establishment in power. Uh, I did consulting for the White House. Um, and then, you know, uh, America started to change. 
America has never been a perfect place, but, uh, but there was, uh, until the 1980s, when the change really began, I would say, uh, until the 1980s, money really did not play an enormous role in American politics. The, the combined expenditures of presidential campaigns, all presidential campaigns of all candidates in, for the presidency in 1976, was $66 million. In 2016, it is projected that it will be $5 billion. And that's a big change. So my investigation of the financial crisis and its origins and its consequences began uh, actually before the crisis itself. Uh, from my earlier life, when I was an academic political scientist and a policy analyst, at MIT, uh, and then later at, at Brookings, another very establishment place, I knew a lot of the people who worked on economic and financial issues like this. And two of these people, Nuriel Rubini and Charles Morris, uh, both of whom are good personal friends of mine, have been for a long time, they started telling me in 2007 that, you know, something is really wrong. <laughs> And at first, I didn't believe them. Uh, Charles Morris sent me his book manuscript in late 2007, which was entitled The Trillion Dollar Meltdown. And I read it, and I thought, you know, this is really scary. And I asked Charlie, well, okay, but, you know, the world looks fine. What's going on? Um, and he said, you know, just wait. And boy, was he right. Uh, so one surprise, and it was a huge surprise to me, was how incredibly severe this crisis was. You know, that some, just the, the mere fact that something like this could occur in the United States and then spread to the rest of the world and have such enormous consequences, that was surprise number one. Surprise number two was that this was not an accident, it was not a mistake, it was a crime. So if somebody had told me, and, and nobody did tell me, if somebody had told me in 2008 that on a massive scale, hundreds of billions of dollars, American investment banks were creating securities and selling them, designing them to fail, with the intent of profiting by betting on their failure, I would have said, no, that's illegal. People don't do that in the United States. It would not be permitted. Well, it turns out it is illegal. It, it actually is not, in principle, illegal to do what I just described, but what is illegal is to lie about it. And it's pretty hard to sell a security like that if you're telling the truth, <laughs> that you're secretly betting on its failure and you've designed it to fail. So in fact, there was massive criminal fraud. And I, I had a sense that it had to be true when I made the film. And then in the two or three years after I made the film, a lot of more information came out. Uh, people started talking, there were some lawsuits, there was additional journalism, and now we know that it was a massive criminal fraud. And there have been zero prosecutions. Zero. And that too is a big change. Uh, the first financial crisis that occurred in the modern era in the United States tiny by current standards, was in the late 1980s. It, it, was, it had to do with the savings and loan industry, a part of the American financial system that doesn't even exist anymore. And in the wake of that crisis, several thousand people were put in jail. There, there was real criminal prosecution. And then this crisis, enormously more serious, enormously more criminal, zero criminal prosecutions. And President Obama, in a way very reminiscent of what he just said yesterday, he's been asked about this several times in the media, and his answer has been the same each time. Uh, well, you know, a lot of bad things occurred, but it turns out that even though they were very bad, they probably weren't criminal, and so there's nothing we can do about it. Well, President Obama went to Harvard Law School, 
And he's no dummy, so he knows that he's lying. There's no doubt whatsoever. He knows he's lying. And é, eu queria que você, é, Glenn, é, contasse um pouco da história mesmo concreta da, da sua descoberta dessa, dessa grande, desse grande furo de reportagem, né? Você é um jornalista muito conhecido já no mundo anglo-saxão. Eu tinha um blog, publicava em diversas é, em diversos jornais. E o que, qual foi o, o momento em que, a, em que as coisas apareceram na sua frente? Né? E eu queria que você falasse também um pouco do Edward Snowden e da Laura Poitras, que são duas, é, dois personagens que deveriam estar aqui conosco nessa mesa é, conversando sobre sobre esse assunto. Como foi que primeira vez você entrou em contato com essa história? Well, just I mean, the context is is actually interesting. I mean, I've told the story so many times of you know when is the first time that I kind of was contacted by Edward Snowden. But I think the context for it is is a little bit more interesting. Even and I'm actually sitting here thinking about it now because Charles and I talked a little bit last night. Um, and when we found out that our moderator was was not going to be here, we didn't know if we were even going to have a moderator, and we were wondering, well, what are we going to do? We're going to just get up there and be two guys talking. And, and at first we thought, you know, it's a little strange. Why are we on a panel together? Because Charles's work, you know, with Inside Job has been about the financial system, and mine has been about foreign policy and national security and, and, and terrorism, and I was a lawyer before that, so to some extent the law, and it seems like there's you know, no real connection. And as Charles just alluded to, I mean, the, what he just described happening in the United States, which is that the most powerful economic actors in America by far, Wall Street executives, tycoons, people who fund those campaigns he's talking about, who own the government, who control it, committed such egregious crimes that hundreds of millions, probably billions of people around the world, including in this country, were seriously harmed by that financial collapse that wasn't like a hurricane or a tornado, it was criminality. And yet none of them, as Charles said, has been punished, not a single one. Um, and then you look at the crimes that American, the, the, the most powerful American political actors have committed over the last decade, not just torture, but invading and destroying a country of 26 million people based on utter lies told to the world, or kidnapping and rendering people who have been charged with no crimes to the worst human rights abusers to be tortured, or putting people in cages in the middle of an ocean thousands of miles away from their home for more than a decade now without any due process, charging them with a crime, spying on the world. Um, you look at all of these crimes and None of those people have been punished as well, even though there's a treaty that virtually every country on the earth is a party to called the Convention Against Torture that says any country that finds within it people who have tortured other people are required to prosecute them, and there is no defense. And we've prosecuted none of our, our torturers, the United States hasn't, or any of those other crimes. And so you, on the one hand, you see the most powerful people in the most powerful country in the world committing the most extreme crimes, literally, that harm hundreds of millions, if not billions of people around the world, paying no consequences whatsoever. And so then you could say, well, maybe that's just because the United States sort of is a lenient place when it comes to criminals. They don't like to punish criminals. The reality, though, is exactly the opposite. The United States imprisons more of its citizens by far than any other country in the world, not just proportionally, but in absolute numbers. Even though China and India have many times more of the population than the United States, there are more people in American prisons than any other country in the world. In fact, the United States is only 5% of the world's population. This is an amazing statistic. The United States is 5% of the world's population. 5% of the people on the globe are American, and yet 25% of all people in prison in the world are imprisoned in the United States. And so at the very same time that we have invested the most powerful people in our country with the right to commit the worst crimes with no punishment of any sort, at the very same time we imprison more of our ordinary powerless citizens 
for trivial crimes, for things that in a lot of other countries they're not even punished for, for longer jail terms under harsher prison conditions. And that is the definition of an inherently corrupt society, where how you're treated is determined not by what you do, but by who you are and how much power you have. It is a complete subversion of the rule of law. And so when you look at somebody like Edward Snowden and you think to yourself, why would somebody like him, who is 29 years old and has an excellent career and makes a lot of money and has a girlfriend who he loves and who loves him and a family who supports him, why would he do something seemingly so extreme and so radical like take many tens of thousands of documents that are marked top secret from his own government and give them to journalists to disclose, the answer, a, an important part of that answer is because he looked at all the things that we've just talked about and said, I think this system has become grossly corrupt. It is out of control, acting without limits, harming people at will, without any consequences. And I, as a human being, feel compelled to do something about this because I don't want to live the rest of my life knowing that I could have done something about it and failed to do so. And the fact that he sought out people like me and Laura Poitras, rather than going to the New York Times or established journalistic outlets, is reflective of the fact that in the United States, our largest media outlets have become part of that system, have endorsed it and have enabled it. If you look at the American attack on Iraq, you can't understand why it happened without realizing that every day our biggest news outlets like the New York Times and NBC News and the Washington Post published one article after the next bolstering these lies and endorsing them and failing to investigate them. And, and so I think what you're seeing, not just with Edward Snowden, but Chelsea Manning and a lot of other people who are starting to engage in more radical dissent, is this realization um, that this system is fundamentally corrupt. And it's important because it happens to be the most powerful country on earth still, and that corruption harms huge numbers of people. And the institutions that are supposed to exist to fight against it the Justice Department, the Congress, the media, the courts are controlled by the very same factions that are engaging in this corruption and therefore are completely incapable or unwilling to act to stop it. And that's why somebody like Edward Snowden feels motivated to take more radical action. I think it's a reflection of the fact that there is systemic failure on the part of American institutions. <laughs> E qual a situação do Snowden hoje? Ele continua na Rússia, ele tem esse pedido encaminhado ao Brasil, que o Brasil dizia que não tinha sido encaminhado, depois é, o ministro de... falou que não ia ser concedido o asilo e, portanto, o pedido foi encaminhado. É, eu queria saber qual a situação dele hoje em termos de asilo e o que você pensa da maneira como o governo brasileiro, que, que foi um um dos, é, entre aspas, beneficiários das suas, das suas denúncias, porque ele, o Ben mostrou que o, o celular da Dilma, a diretoria da Petrobras, estavam sendo espionados com é, razões econômicas e mercadológicas. E a população, em geral? Eu acho que... Bem, primeiro de tudo, como Snowden está preocupado, ele tem um asilo, tecnicamente, por um ano na Rússia which expired two days ago. Um, but the Russian government has been very clear that they will continue to give him a form of asylum, whether it's another year or permanent. Um, the chances that the U.S. government will be able to get their hands on Edward Snowden in the foreseeable future is essentially zero. Um, I was just in Moscow, I think, six to eight weeks ago and met with him. Um, and he's doing remarkably well. Um, he walks around Moscow uh, at will. People recognize him sometimes, but not very much. He sort of looks like, you know, this 18-year-old kid who kind of is on his first foreign vacation. Um, and so he's free to do that. And more importantly, um, he's free to participate in the debate that he helped to trigger around the world. Um, and actually, this is a really important part of this because 
the United States government is really afraid of future Edward Snowdens or future Chelsea Mannings because the way that the United States government stores its data electronically, it's impossible to prevent there from being whistleblowers or leakers. And the only hope that they have to keep what they're doing a secret is to destroy the lives of anybody who comes and reveals it because they want to intimidate and bully and deter future whistleblowers. And so the fact that Edward Snowden is a free human being who participates in the debate around the world and isn't in an American prison is really important um, for inspiring future Edward Snowdens. Um, and as far as you know, the asylum question is concerned, uh, I'll just actually, I'll just tell a quick little story. I talked about this this morning in, in, in an interview I did, and, and it's actually it's it's amusing, but it's also important. I, I did a debate two months ago in in Canada um, with Michael Hayden, who's the former head of the the CIA and the NSA. Um, and obviously, Michael Hayden doesn't have a very good opinion um, of Edward Snowden or of me, but particularly of Edward Snowden. And one of the things the debate does, um, it's a big debate in Canada, they have it every year, is they always ask one or two people to record a videotape with their own question for the debaters. And the organizers, without telling us, got Edward Snowden to record a two-minute video asking a question of Michael Hayden. So I was sitting next to General Hayden, just this distance, and we were debating the leaks in the NSA, and he was defending the NSA and talking about how angry he was about these leaks, and all of a sudden there was this enormous television screen that descended from the ceiling, and on the television screen was projected the image of Edward Snowden above General Hayden's head, um, and then he got to speak and make points and then pose a question to, to General Hayden, who was then obligated to answer it. And this is really important, this imagery, because it shows that he's become an important voice in the debate and not treated as a criminal or a prisoner. He's considered a hero by people around the world. Um, when I testified before the Brazilian Senate, several senators went over to the students who were aligning the wall and took the Snowden masks they were wearing and wore it themselves, which is an extraordinary thing. And this will help future whistleblowers know that they can do that without having their lives destroyed. Um, but I do think the question of asylum in Brazil is, is incredibly important because I do think that every country that has benefited the most from the sacrifice and courage of Edward Snowden has not just the legal obligation but the moral obligation to stand up and do for him what he has done for all these other countries. And, you know... I, I mean, it, it, it is an interesting debate because everybody knows that both the German government and the Brazilian government benefited greatly from his revelations. Um, it isn't just the spying on, on Dilma's cell phone or Petrobras or the Ministry of Mines and Energy, but the two billion calls and emails and the data from it that the United States collects every day or every month from the Brazilian telecommunication system. The Brazilian government is now able to think about how to develop technologies to protect against that. So the only conceivable reason why the Brazilian government or the German government would refuse to give asylum to Edward Snowden is because they're more afraid of alienating the United States than they are defending the basic rights of this human being who, who sacrificed so much. And that, I think, is, is the ongoing debate, and that will be the cause. É, o Glenn enfrentou uma reação é, muito tensa e violenta dos, do, de autoridades de diversos países, inclusive o seu namorado, seu amigo, né, marido David, foi preso na, na Inglaterra e existem riscos né, ainda. Tem uma pergunta da plateia perguntando se você teme é, pela sua família, se, tem algum, se você sofreu ameaças concretas desse tipo. And the, the, you know, the United States government, from the very beginning of this reporting, had a strategy of trying to put us, namely the journalists who were working on the story, in fear that if we did the reporting, um, very bad things would happen to us. You know, I mean, if you're a journalist and you say, it's very easy to say, I want to challenge those in power. Um, it's easy to say that. But the nature of doing that 
means that if you challenge people in power, they can do things back to you. Um, that's what it means to be powerful, is that you can punish those who, who challenge you and reward those who... Who I think it's really interesting that if you look at what the United States government, and not just the United States government, but it's, say, Western allies, the NATO allies, have said over and over again over the last decade to justify pretty much every single thing they do, from attacking and bombing other countries to hiding most of what they're doing from their own citizens, they invoke the word terrorism as a kind of threat in the hope that people will be afraid enough of what it is that they're warning about that people will simply submit to whatever it is they're doing. And, and you see the same tactic in response to our reporting over and over. People say, well, I'm not really comfortable with what it is that you're doing because I think by revealing these secrets, you might actually be helping the terrorists. And one of the really fascinating things about this concept of terrorism is that although it is used over and over and over and over again by the United States and pretty much everybody, it's actually a word that has almost no meaning of any kind. You cannot find a meaning of the word terrorism or terrorist um, that will help you to understand what that word actually supposed, is supposed to be. And I think one of the most interesting examples is if you look at the last month, um, in, in what's happening in, in Gaza. Um, the, there's one side of that attack, the Israelis, who have killed something like um, 900 innocent people, 900 civilians. I think it's now 75 or 80 percent of the people that the Israelis have killed in Gaza, at least 75 or 80 percent, are completely innocent. Children, women, innocent men. By contrast, the people in Gaza, the Palestinians who are fighting against the Israelis, have killed almost no Israeli civilians. There have been a total of 56 Israelis killed in the last month, 53 of whom are soldiers. Um, and so you have one side that's killing overwhelmingly civilians, and the other side that's killing overwhelmingly soldiers of an invading army. And yet, in the United States, almost always, the side that's actually killing the soldiers is called the terrorists, and the side that's killing the innocent civilians is called the democracy fighting against terrorism. <laughs> and you know, when, when you see that, you realize just how little meaning the word terrorism has. Or if you look at what the United States did in Iraq, the same thing. The strategy that we were told as Americans our government was going to use was called shock and awe, meaning we were going to invade Iraq and show them such an overwhelming amount of violence that they would be terrorized into full submission. I mean, if you're going to have a definition of terrorism, um, that would have to be the classic case. And yet the idea that the American government is actually engaged in terrorism or terrorists is something that, at least in the United States, you can't really say without having huge numbers of people look at you as though you're not serious. And so when I get asked, you know, is what you're doing helpful to the terrorists, I mean, it's a question that really almost makes no sense to me because this word is just a slogan. It is pure fear-mongering. Um, it's not an actual word that serious people should treat as though it's an objective concept. The other thing I would say is, um, you know, one of the really interesting parts of the last year um, has been the way in which we have revealed these documents. I think it's pretty known that we have many, many, many tens of thousands of top secret documents from the United States government. The U.S. government says the number is 1.7 million, although they just made that number up. They actually have no idea how many documents Edward Snowden took or how many he gave me, but it's certainly a huge number. And over the last year, we have published a relatively small percentage of those documents. And the reason that we've done that is because the U.S. government got very lucky that the person who took all of their documents is actually an extremely cautious and even kind of a conservative 
um, whistleblower. I know it's ironic to think about somebody <clears throat> who takes tens of thousands or more top secret documents from a government, downloads them all, and gives them to journalists as being conservative and careful, but he actually is. And he insisted that we be very, very meticulous in only publishing the documents that the, that people around the world need to know in order to have a meaningful debate and a democratic decision-making process to decide whether they want to live in a world where the U.S. government and its allies can turn the Internet into a massive um, realm of surveillance, but not publish things that could destroy those systems unilaterally or which could put innocent lives at risk. And, and we actually have been so careful um, that a lot of my supporters and allies for a long time, like WikiLeaks and other people, have actually been kind of critical um, that we haven't published more documents. And between the people who accuse us of publishing recklessly and saying we've published so many secrets and we're helping the terrorists, or the people who on the other side who get a lot less attention but who say we actually haven't published enough, I think the people who say we haven't published enough actually have a much more valid criticism. Um, and when I stay up at night worried about the work we've done and the work we're continuing to do, I think much, much more about how to release more documents than I do thinking about, oh, did we release too much in and help the terrorists. Um, as far as the, the question about journalism versus activism, you know, I think this is one of the, the really important uh, questions in, in American journalism. You know, if you look at how journalism typically functioned for hundreds of years in the world, not just in the United States, Journalism wasn't this kind of like class of professionals who worked for big corporations and who wore suits and spoke very cautiously and were afraid to alienate or offend anybody. Journalism was a tool that citizens used to publish things about those in power, to work against injustices, to undermine those in power. And that's the kind of journalism I believe in. And this idea that, oh, there's this certain kind of journalist, the professional journalist, who exists without any opinions and who doesn't work for any agendas, is a complete myth. As human beings, we all have strong opinions. We all work towards some sort of an outcome. And so for me, the question is not, are you a journalist who has opinions versus a journalist who doesn't have opinions? Because there is no such thing as a journalist who doesn't have an opinion. The question for me is, are you a journalist who's honest and says what your assumptions are? Or are you a journalist who tries to pretend that you have no opinions and therefore mislead the people to who, for whom you're writing? And, you know, it is, it is true, I mean, if you look at, you know, American journalism and how it's practiced at the highest levels, and I agree with Charles a thousand percent, even the, the media organizations I criticize the most, like the New York Times or CNN, do have good journalists within them who are doing really good journalism, but as, a, as an institution, um, they've adopted this mindset that all large corporations ultimately adopt, which is, we don't want to make judgments, we don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to say anything interesting. We just kind of want to say, here's what one side says, here's what the other side says. It's not for me to decide or for me to judge who's telling the truth. And that's the kind of journalism that I despise and I think that gives comfort to corrupt people in power. Because if journalists aren't willing to say these people in power are lying or acting corruptly because that's too opinionated or that makes you an activist, that neuters journalism. It makes journalism worthless. Um, and I am somebody who has opinions. I do think that it's wrong when people who have the greatest power act corruptly. I do think it's wrong for the U.S. government to go around the world killing people at will or to invade other countries and bomb them or to spy on them and destroy privacy in secret or that it's wrong for Wall Street to engage in systemic fraud without any consequences. And I don't see any reason why, as a journalist, I should pretend that I don't think those things. I think journalism only is meaningful when it actively works against injustices wielded by those people who have the greatest power. É, mas é, me parece também que, do ponto de vista legal, você ser considerado jornalista te traz proteções que um ativista, entre aspas, não teria, né? Você acha que teve essa intenção também 
em te expor aí ao, a, uma, a eventuais punições é, da parte dos jornalistas mesmo, de te classificar como um ativista para que não fosse, para que, portanto, não fosse protegido pelas leis que protegem o jornalismo? Ou oh, diferença entre jornalismo e ativista? Você e... aceita o palavra? Ativista? Não, porque o, é, se você for considerado um ativista, a, a Constituição americana não está te, defe, te protegendo como um protege um jornalista. Por exemplo, você não é obrigado a revelar suas fontes. Sim. Você vê isso, uma intenção em, em tentar te desqualificar como jornalista? I, I mean, I think the problem is, I, I think that all journalism is a form of activism. Um, so if you look at, for example, what American media outlets did in the run-up to the Iraq War, um, publishing everything the government said under the guise of, well, we're just here to report, they pretended they weren't being activists, but they were actually working very hard to convince Americans to support the war in Iraq. Um, or one of the things that was a big controversy in the American media was the U.S. government engaged, as everybody knows, and as President Obama admitted yesterday, um, in torture. They used interrogation techniques that clearly were torture. And these techniques were always called torture by American media outlets when they were done by other governments. So if the Japanese waterboarded, the New York Times would say the Japanese tortured. Um, or if uh, North Koreans put people in stress positions and purposely made them cold and did not deprive them of sleep, um, CNN would say the North Koreans are torturing people or Iran is doing the same thing. The minute though the United States started doing it, um, the American media outlets stopped calling it torture. And the reason they stopped calling it torture was because they said, well, the Bush administration says that this isn't torture. And some people say it's torture, other people say it's not torture. Who are we as journalists to decide whether or not this is really torture? So we're just going to call it harsh interrogation techniques um, because we're neutral. And although this is claimed as neutrality, in the United States was much, much worse during the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, much, much worse during the Vietnam War, and yet those protests grew. In fact, police repression made them grow even bigger and more angry and more important. So no, I, I think that the fundamental reason, unfortunately, is the state of American society and the way that people feel about the political system. Bom, a gente tem tempo para uma última pergunta rápida, eu vou fazer a você, Glenn. É, uma das coisas que me impressionaram no seu livro é a, como a riqueza de detalhes que falou-se muito em 1984, do George Orwell, mas é, toda a descrição dos programas, você vê que tem as janelas dos programas usados pela NSA que permitem que você pesquise o histórico de internet da pessoa, fotos pornográficas, é, contatos do Facebook, é uma coisa muito sofisticada. É, roteadores de internet com programas implantados para enviar dados para a NSA, né, enquanto os Estados Unidos acusavam os chineses de fazerem isso. Né, diziam, não comprem chineses porque eles estão... Queria que você contasse rapidamente, a gente realmente já está com o tempo estourado, mas essas, entre aspas, anedotas de mau gosto que, que a NSA é, criou com esses programas, esse aparato todo... Yeah, I did a, a uh, press conference this morning with um, some journalists, um, most of whom were Brazilian, and they asked me why has Brazil become such a significant target for the NSA, and my answer was the one that I, I mean, there are reasons specifically about Brazil and its growing influence um, in the region, but, but generally the answer I gave was, was the one I always give whenever I go to other countries where there's been reporting about spying by the NSA, when people ask me in these other countries why do they care about Norway, or why do they care about India, or why do they care about, you know, um, the Netherlands? And my answer always is the NSA doesn't need a reason to target communications for very sophisticated forms of surveillance. The goal of the NSA, as they themselves say in their own documents, is to collect all forms of electronic communication and have them susceptible to being analyzed and monitored. It is literally a goal that says we want to eliminate privacy 
in the digital age. And, and that's why I think it has such extraordinary consequences is because it's not specifically targeted at this particular leader or this particular country. Um, the target is the internet. The target is human communications um, and making sure that there is no such thing any longer as privacy in the electronic age. And um, I think it's hard to overstate the consequences of that. Muito bem. Muito obrigado aos nossos obrigado. dois convidados. Review or please you. And so the United States government from the beginning, publicly and privately, was threatening to imprison me and, and other journalists who, who were working on the story. And the detention of my partner um, was, for me, the probably the worst day maybe of my life, but certainly of the last year. I mean, if you think about what they did, they took the person who's most important to me in the world, who I love the most, and deliberately targeted him instead of the journalist and put him and locked him in a room for 11 hours under a terrorism law um, and threatened the entire day that they would arrest him and put him in a prison in, 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 in London um, where I couldn't have access to him. Brazilian diplomats all day were denied access to even find out what was being done. And then it turned out, unsurprisingly, that the U.S. government knew ahead of time that the British intended to do that. The reason they did it is because they had been monitoring and surveilling our conversations. Um, and I think it indicates what the strategy of the U.S. and the U.K. governments are to anybody who tries to challenge them, which is to intimidate, to put you in fear, in the case of, of my partner, to actually threaten to criminally prosecute. Um, there are actually, though, a lot of journalists who work with much less visibility than this story, who are confronted with far worse threats and greater dangers all the time. One of the great things about the last year is I've had the opportunity to get to know a lot of journalists who do this kind of work, and, and this is how people in power try and respond to those who challenge them. Um, but I do think it's interesting that the U.S. government and the, the British government like to parade around the world as the defender of free press and criticizing other countries for attacking journalists, and yet that was their strategy from the beginning. But, you know, if you are convinced that what you're doing is right, And this was sort of the lesson I learned from Edward Snowden. You have to take some precautions, the precautions that you can take. Um, and then the best thing you can do against people who are trying to be intimidated in that way is to work as hard as you can against them and ignore the risks. And, um, you know, ultimately, I think that proved to be successful in this case. <laughs> Charles, eu queria falar com você é, sobre o fato de você ter ganhado o Oscar, que é o você é um segundo, se não me engano, foi com o seu, é, seu segundo filme, Trabalho Interno, é, simplesmente ganhou o Oscar, é, o maior prêmio da área, é o Oscar de, o Oscar de documentário. E o filme foi transformado depois em livro, é, numa versão aumentada, que é o sequestro da América, como as corporações financeiras corromperam os Estados Unidos. E ele aumenta a, a, a pesquisa, faz um, um, um adendo aí, né? Mudar, para a sua carreira de cineasta, certamente foi um ótimo ter ganhado o Oscar, te deu é, certeza de prosseguir nos seus projetos. Você logo em seguida começou um documentário sobre a Hillary Clinton, é, sempre cotada como provável presidente... É candidata a presidente dos Estados Unidos e é, interrompeu esse projeto. Eu queria saber por que você interrompeu. Yes. Um, well, it, it turns out that there's a, a quite substantial downside to being famous. Uh, so the when when I won the Oscar and it, uh, made the speech that I made on on television, I pointed out, when I when I got the Oscar, I pointed out that there had been no criminal prosecutions and said that was wrong. And So everybody knew my face and my work, and so when, and, and the good side of that is that I've been offered a lot of very interesting work, and uh, including the film that I'm now making, which is about climate change and sustainability and energy globally, very ambitious film. Uh, so I was offered several things, and one of the things that, uh, that I was offered was to make a documentary uh, about Hillary Clinton, which, is, uh, which I thought was a very interesting project. And so I 
started and, and CNN, which which was the organization that offered me the job. Well, you know, one thing that I will say is that I would say to a large degree, I agree with Glenn's comments about the nature of the media in the United States. The media has become very complacent and very part of the problem and very captured by power and money. No question about that. But not completely. There are still, even in large companies uh, that are owned by conglomerates, there are still organizations and people that try to do serious, good, critical, honest work. And so CNN, which is a very establishment uh, channel, uh, offered uh, to fund on very generous terms my making a, a documentary about Hillary Clinton. And they gave me final cut. They gave me complete editorial control over the film. Um, and everybody was very nice and very supportive, including even after, um, as we say in the United States, the shit hit the fan. Uh, so uh, Hillary Clinton has, and the Clintons, the Clinton family, they have a well-developed intelligence apparatus. And the day that the contract was signed, I got a phone call from Hillary Clinton's press secretary saying, Mr. Ferguson, we understand you're making a film. <laughs> and there began an extraordinary journey, and, and that journey was basically me versus the Clintons. Now, you know, in general, and in every other situation that I've encountered, including my first film, which was about the occupation of Iraq, where I spent a month in occupied Iraq in 2006, a uh, very dangerous place, not a garden spot, and I did that without any U.S. government or military support. Uh, I hired at my own expense. I spent a quarter million dollars on my personal security and the security of my film team. Uh, I had 15 armed guards everywhere I went. So, you know, I'm used to circumstances in which somebody doesn't want me to find something out. And in fact, I love it. There's nothing that I love more when I come to understand that somebody doesn't want me to learn something. When I find that out, I just think, oh, yum. <laughs> and. <laughs> It's, so, you know, sometimes making these films, even in the grimmest of circumstances, and believe me, Iraq was very grim, even in the grimmest of circumstances, it can be very interesting and very enjoyable, and I usually find out what I want to know. The Clintons were an amazing exception. I met a wall of silence that I have never encountered elsewhere in my life, ever. I spoke to hundreds of people. About six of them agreed to speak with me off the record privately, and two agreed to be interviewed on camera. So I thought, you know, I could make some kind of movie, but could I make a movie that I was proud of? Could I make a movie that I thought really got to the heart of the matter? Could I make a movie that anybody would want to watch? So I decided no, so I quit. And now I'm making another movie, <laughs> which I'm very excited about. Qual é o seu novo filme que você está trabalhando? Que filme é esse que você está fazendo? So, uh, I'm making a film about the global challenge of climate change and, more broadly, sustainability. Uh, both energy and land use, and very globally. Uh, I've, I've spent six months doing research, and we've just started filming. We've already done some filming in the United States and in Europe. Uh, we're going to be filming in Brazil for several weeks. Uh, I'm also going to be filming in Indonesia, in China, in several countries in Africa. Kenya is the first one. Uh, and I have to say it has been an amazing, amazing trajectory. And here, too, I have come across a gigantic and, in this case, very positive surprise, which is that, it's a surprise to me anyway, which is that this is a solvable problem. If we were to decide that we wanted to deal with the climate problem and the energy problem and the food problem, we could. We know how to. And the costs and characteristics of wind power and solar power and other renewable energy uh, are now such that if you include the costs of pollution from conventional energy, 
we would probably actually save money and make our lives better if we converted to renewable energy and sustainable agriculture. And I hope to be able to bring that message to a very large number of people because it's an important message. And, you know, th this place where we are now, this is the most beautiful place on earth. Please don't let it be ruined. And. O seu filme vai ser lançado em outubro de 2015, é isso? No final de, do, do ano que vem. É, temos uma pergunta aqui para você também, do Roberto Teixeira da Costa, que é nosso conselheiro. Ele está dizendo, é, mais de 100 bilhões de dólares foram depositados por instituições financeiras como penalidade pela gestão financeira que originou a crise de 2008. Considera essas multas, essas multas suficientes para cobrir os prejuízos causados? Aí tem uma segunda pergunta, que é, é, the Volcker Law, que proíbe os bancos de ter carteiras próprias, é uma medida na, na direção correta? Well, first, as to the first question, uh, the, the total size of fines uh, that have been levied against all financial institutions globally uh, since the 2008 crisis, it probably has reached $100 billion by now. Um, and you might think that that's a lot of money, but it turns out it's not. And most of those fines were not for behavior related to the financial crisis, because what happened in the wake of the financial crisis was that uh, it, it became clear partially through losses caused by the financial crisis, a lot of other behavior was revealed. And it turned out that the banking industry globally, not just in the United States, in fact, some European banks were among the worst offenders, uh, it turned out that uh, the large banks had been committing a considerable number of crimes, not just related to the financial crisis, but also related to conspiring to fix exchange rates, conspiring to fix interest rates, um, and also uh, violating anti-terrorism regulations related to money laundering uh, on a massive scale. It turned out that European banks and even some American banks had been uh, involved in uh, transferring large quantities of money on behalf of Iran, North Korea, Sudan, um, nations that, you know, really are not doing nice things. And a lot of the fines related to that behavior. Most of those fines in the United States are tax deductible, by the way. So the banks get to take the money off of their tax payments, uh, which is kind of extraordinary. Um, but I find humor where it's obtainable, and sometimes it's in unexpected places. Uh, the, there have been various estimates of the total uh, size of the losses associated with the financial crisis. The best estimates that I've seen uh, are in the neighborhood of 25, 30, 40 trillion dollars, not billion dollars, trillion dollars. So a hundred billion dollars in fines isn't a lot in the first place. And in the second place, it's only a small fraction of the profits that the financial sector has made over the last decade. The financial sector is very profitable. E quanto a, é, bom. Ah, the, uh, the, the, the second question about the Volcker Law. The, the, the Volcker Law, um, it's, it's nice, but it turns out that it's very detailed and very complicated. There are many exceptions and many exclusions, and banks have been given delays, they've been given regulatory exemptions, they've been given exceptions of various kinds. There's no visible enforcement. Nobody's been prosecuted for violating it. So I can't say that the, that the reforms, quote unquote, in the wake of the financial crisis really have encouraged me a great deal. I don't think that there will be another crisis like this soon because people still remember the last crisis and they're being a little more careful. So it'll be another decade before people kind of forget and the bankers invent something new and, you know, but we, we could face another problem like this again in the future. É, eu queria fazer uma pergunta para o Glenn, que veio aqui da, da plateia, do André Laurentino. Ele pergunta, como expor a má conduta da CIA e da NSA sem, no entanto, revelar os, aos terroristas informações sobre a segurança nacional? Isso foi uma, uma, um questionamento que você recebeu nos Estados Unidos particularmente, né? 
Eu queria te perguntar também, é, se você acredita numa, numa, numa transparência total, se, se há segredos de Estado que devem ser preservados ou não. E também queria te perguntar sobre essa é, controvérsia que houve. É, houve um ímpeto muito grande em chamar você de ativista e não de jornalista. Né? Assim que, que estourou, estourou o escândalo, vários comentaristas começaram, não, mas ele é um ativista, ele não é um jornalista. O que significa essa, essa terminologia em termos concretos, né? Hmm. Uh, so, first of all, the first question... Um...
presidential campaigns of all candidates in, for the presidency in 1976 was $66 million. In 2016, it is projected that it will be $5 billion. And that's a big change. So my investigation of the financial crisis and its origins and its consequences began uh, actually before the crisis itself. Uh, from my earlier life, when I was an academic political scientist and a policy analyst at MIT, uh, and then later at, at Brookings, another very establishment place, I knew a lot of the people who worked on economic and financial issues like this. And two of these people, Nuriel Rubini and Charles Morris, uh, both of whom are good personal friends of mine, have been for a long time, they started telling me in 2007 that, you know, something is really wrong. <laughs> and at first I didn't believe them. Uh, Charles Morris sent me his book manuscript in late 2007, which was entitled The Trillion Dollar Meltdown. And I read it and I thought, you know, this is really scary. And I asked Charlie, well, okay, but, you know, the world looks fine. What's going on? Um, and he said, you know, just wait. And boy, was he right. Uh, so one surprise, and it was a huge surprise to me, was how incredibly severe this crisis was. You know, that some, just the, the mere fact that something like this could occur in the United States and then spread to the rest of the world and have such enormous consequences, that was surprise number one. Surprise number two was that this was not an accident, it was not a mistake, it was a crime. So if somebody had told me, and, and nobody did tell me, if somebody had told me in 2008 that on a massive scale, hundreds of billions of dollars, American investment banks were creating securities and selling them, designing them to fail, with the intent of profiting by betting on their failure, I would have said, no, that's illegal. People don't do that in the United States. It would not be permitted. Well, it turns out it is illegal. It, it actually is not, in principle, illegal to do what I just described, but what is illegal is to lie about it. And it's pretty hard to sell a security like that if you're telling the truth, that you're secretly betting on its failure and you've designed it to fail. So in fact, there was massive criminal fraud. And I, I had a sense that it had to be true when I made the film. And then in the two or three years after I made the film, a lot of more information came out uh, people started talking, there were some lawsuits, there was additional journalism, and now we know. E peço também que, se possível, retirem as baterias. Celulares. E peço também que, se possível, retirem as baterias, o chip, e coloquem... ímpeto oficial de coletar tudo, que é como foi chamada internamente a, a política de armazenamento insano de dados, de cruzamento de dados, de pessoas comuns, comuns como nós, é, e se infiltrando em empresas de internet, no Google, na Apple, Facebook, todo mundo aqui, eu não preciso explicar que todo mundo aqui tem aí contas em diversas dessas... É, Dessas, dessas empresas de tecnologia. E o Charles Ferguson, que está do meu lado, é, eu tenho a honra de apresentar o primeiro prêmio Oscar aqui em Paraty. Ele é um, fez um trabalho notável, chamado Inside Job, em português é trabalho interno, em que ele esmiuça, explica, é, disseca o que foi essa crise financeira que até hoje tem consequências. É, a gente está vivendo o mesmo sistema financeiro que, que, que fez os americanos perderem as suas casas, né? 
que fez as pessoas é, perderem a sua poupança e, e pessoas comuns como, como nós. Né? Então essa mesa traz aqui uma conversa sobre espionagem, sobre imperialismo, sobre mercado financeiro, mas também sobre a nossa vida dia, diária, sobre o cotidiano, sobre as ameaças que existem às nossas liberdades, à nossa privacidade, ao nosso patrimônio, é, que está sob custódia de instituições financeiras. Então eu vou começar pedindo para os autores fazerem uma, uma breve é, explanação dos, do, dos projetos que, que o trazem aqui a Paraty, e também falar dos dobramentos recentes. Eu vou pedir até para o Glenn Greenwald começar, porque ontem mesmo tivemos um, mais um desdobramento dessa, dessa cobertura que rendeu a ele e aos jornais onde ele publicou é, a cobertura, o prêmio Pulitzer, o mais importante do jornalismo, é, que foi dado à reportagem que ele publicou no jornal The Guardian. Ele também no Brasil ganhou o S, junto com o jornal o Globo, e ganhou o Polk nos Estados Unidos, a ocasião que ele voltou pela primeira vez aos Estados Unidos depois de ter feito essas denúncias. Mas ontem o Obama fez uma, é, uma confissão, não é? Ele, ele, o que foi que o Obama disse? E eu queria que você explicasse então para a gente o que é essa sua essa grande reportagem que você. Hi, first of all, hello everybody. Um, yeah, yesterday. Uh... Obama was asked about a scandal in the United States. There is an investigation that the American Senate is conducting into the CIA's use of torture. Over the we can even torture them without any consequences is something that he very much believes in. And I think those comments yesterday indicated that. É. Charles, você é, fez também um trabalho de muita envergadura que expôs é, o mecanismo de, muito difícil de compreender para um leigo de como é, a crise bancária, quer dizer, como os bancos estimularam pessoas a comprar papéis é, podres, né, que não valiam nada é, e eles, a, fizeram isso com o, a, o suporte de, de professores universitários das melhores universidades, onde todos aqui gostariam de ver seus filhos, né? é, que fizeram estudos é, errados sobre a Islândia, por exemplo, falando o título do artigo de, do seu entrevistado, até dizia, ah, uma, novas oportunidades no horizonte, e ele depois corrigiu, dizem, é, a, simplesmente trocou o adjetivo é, como que invertendo completamente o, o significado do artigo. Né? Então, foi um conluio entre é, bancos, entre autoridades financeiras e entre é, é, professores universitários que, que, que alimentam os relatórios dos bancos e estimulam, no final das contas, as pessoas a investir, que levou a essa crise gravíssima de consequências globais. É, como foi... Eu, que você começou essa, esse trabalho, foi no calor da hora, a, a bomba estourou e você sentiu que precisava estar lá? E, e quais foram as consequências? Porque também me parece que, como o Glenn Greenwald estava contando, de certa forma tudo continua igual, né? não, não, não se puniram os responsáveis e a legislação não, não foi substancialmente alterada. Como, como foram as consequências disso? Um, uh, this has been an extraordinary journey for me, um, working on uh, these issues. I actually uh, started life, you know, I, I don't know whether you'll regard this as uh, something of which I should be deeply ashamed or... <laughs> I, I actually started my adult life as a member of the establishment. Uh, I got a PhD in political science from MIT. My thesis advisor uh, was a very eminent American who had been a professor at Harvard, had been deputy national security advisor for President Kennedy. Um, I, I dealt very fluidly, very comfortably with uh, people in the establishment in power. Uh, I did consulting for the White House. Um, and then, you know, uh, America started to change. 
America has never been a perfect place, but uh, but there was uh, until the 1980s when the change really began. I would say uh, until the 1980s, money really did not play an enormous role in American politics. The the combined expenditures of presidential campaigns, all presidential last 10 years, and they've been investigating torture, American torture around the world for two or three years now. And the CIA is very worried about what this investigation will reveal because the CIA essentially committed very serious war crimes of the kind that the United States has demanded other countries and other agencies be punished for for many years. And in order to find out what the Senate was doing, the CIA actually spied on the Senate's investigation. They invaded the computers that they were using. They read the emails back and forth between the Senate investigators. And when the accusation that the CIA did this was first revealed, the head of the CIA, who is President Obama, is one of his closest advisors. He used to work in the White House, and, and he's now the head of the CIA, John Brennan. He publicly denied that the CIA did this. And in fact, they even filed a criminal investigation against people in the Senate, um, claiming that they had uh, maligned them and had made false claims. And this week, it turned out there was a, an investigation done within the CIA into these allegations, and the CIA investigators themselves concluded that, in fact, the CIA had invaded the computer networks of the Senate and had spied on the investigation. And so it turned out the CIA director lied. Um, the CIA really did spy on the Senate, um, which is an extraordinary threat to just democracy. And so Obama had to address this. And um, he addressed it by saying that he still has the full confidence of the director of the CIA because apparently President Obama is not bothered by spying on the Senate and then lying to the public about it. Um, but he had to also address the investigation itself. And one of the things he said was he admitted, I think for the first time when he was president, he said, the, he said, we tortured some folks. That was his exact quote. Um, so it was significant because it was an admission by the American president that the United States actually did torture people. But it was also significant because of the way he phrased it. We tortured some folks. It's it's very casual um, way of, of admitting to the most serious war crime a country can do. And he then went on to say, oh, but you have to understand the people who did the torturing were under a lot of pressure. They had a lot of fear about terrorism. And so we really shouldn't judge them um, sanctimoniously as though yeah, they tortured, but, you know, they were good people, just good people who tortured. Um, and, you know, this really underscores, I think, President Obama's last six years in office, which is he says nice, pretty words to people, um, but at the same time, the policies that underlie American imperialism and the mindset that underlies it, which is we as Americans are the most powerful and therefore we can do whatever we want in the world. We can invade other countries and destroy them. We can decide people should die and send drones over to them. We can spy on the entire world. Um, and we'll that it was a massive criminal fraud. And there have been zero prosecutions, zero. And that, too, is a big change. Uh, the first financial crisis that occurred in the modern era in the United States, tiny by current standards, was in the late 1980s. It, it, was, it had to do with the savings and loan industry, a part of the American financial system that doesn't even exist anymore. And in the wake of that crisis, several thousand people were put in jail. There, there was real criminal prosecution. And then this crisis, enormously more serious, enormously more criminal, zero criminal prosecutions. And President Obama, in a way very reminiscent of what he just said yesterday, he's been asked about this several times in the media, and his answer has been the same each time. Uh, well, you know, a lot of bad things occurred, but it turns out that even though they were very bad, they probably weren't criminal, and so there's nothing we can do about it. Well, President Obama went to Harvard Law School, 
And he's no dummy, so he knows that he's lying. There's no doubt whatsoever. He knows he's lying. And é, eu queria que você, é, Glenn, é, contasse um pouco da história mesmo concreta da, da sua descoberta dessa, dessa grande, desse grande furo de reportagem. Né? Você é um jornalista muito conhecido já no mundo anglo-saxão. Eu tinha um blog, publicava em diversas é, em diversos jornais e o que qual foi o, o momento em que, a, em que as coisas apareceram na sua frente né? e eu queria que você falasse também um pouco do Edward Snowden e da Laura Poitras que são duas é, dois personagens que deveriam estar aqui conosco nessa mesa é, conversando sobre sobre esse assunto como foi que primeira vez você entrou em contato com essa história Well, just, I mean, the context is, is actually interesting. I mean, I've told the story so many times of, you know, when is the first time that I kind of was contacted by Edward Snowden. But I think the context for it is, is a little bit more interesting even, and I'm actually sitting here thinking about it now because Charles and I talked a little bit last night, um, and when we found out that our moderator was, was not going to be here, we didn't know if we were even going to have a moderator, and we were wondering, well, what are we going to do? We're going to just get up there and be two guys talking. And, and at first we thought, you know, it's a little strange. Why are we on a panel together? Because Charles's work, you know, with Inside Job has been about the financial system and mine has been about foreign policy and national security and, and, and terrorism. And I was a lawyer before that, so to some extent the law. And it seems like there's, you know, no real connection. And as Charles just alluded to, I mean, the, what he just described happening in the United States, which is that the most powerful economic actors in America, by far, Wall Street executives, tycoons, people who fund those campaigns he's talking about, who own the government, who control it, committed such